And good morning, everyone. We are glad that you are here this morning with us at North Citrus Christian Church and uh, getting into the new year and getting into our first potluck of the year. Uh, we're going to enjoy that after the service today, so we encourage you to stay for that and uh, also have a special movie presentation after the potluck. If you've not seen this movie, I highly recommend that you take some time just to stay to enjoy it. Uh, it's a special on Pure Flix called Life Mark, a Christian movie that you will enjoy uh, today. So that'll happen right after the potluck after church today. Uh, we do want to welcome those of you who are visiting with us, perhaps for the first or second time. I uh, encourage you to fill out a welcome card that you'll find there in the pocket in front of you. Uh, you can place those uh, cards on either end of the auditorium in the wooden boxes that are there or in the back. This is also where regular attenders and members uh, place your offering as we do not pass an offering plate here at North Citrus. Several things happening this week I want to just let you know about. Uh, starting back into some regular activity with our Tuesday nights, uh, Moms in Prayer. That's happening Tuesday, uh, 545. Also, the Young Adult Ministry is Tuesday night, uh, starting back up at 630. And, of course, our Wednesday night life groups um, are up um, at 6 o'clock over in Citrus Cafe. Please note, coming up, uh, the annual congregational meeting next week, so that will be happening. And then uh, the 20th is our game night on a Friday night. And then special foundations class on the 22nd. This is designed for those who have been coming to church. If you haven't had a chance to get a chance to sit down and, and take a look at the scriptures from what we believe uh, the Bible says and what our uh, beliefs are, the foundation for what we do here at the church. It uh, gives you a chance to meet some other folks, meet some staff. Uh, we'll do lunch that day. Uh, that uh, will be provided, and then we'll go with a class until about 2.30 on the 22nd. So if you've not taken in that class, I encourage you to do that. Um, you can sign in uh, back on the table in the entryway back this direction, and uh, then we'll go from there. All right, well, let's, uh, let's have prayer, and then we'll go right into our worship time together. Father God, we... We look to you for direction. We're not always sure where that direction comes from, but we simply ask that you lead us by your spirit. Father, I pray that you just watch over your church uh, here at North Citrus, and we pray that you grow your church. Father, we thank you uh, for those that are here today, uh, for those that may be watching online. We're grateful. Lord, we know that there's some that are out uh, due to illness and uh, not feeling well and health issues, and Lord, we pray that you watch over them. Father, I just pray that you just uh, uh, purify our hearts, just do what you need to do in our hearts to put us in tune with you. And Father, may the joy of the Lord be our strength, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Would you guys like to stand and join us in singing out our praises and come let us worship the Lord? Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give. Just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God, one day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just 
as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, come, come, Fears are still, when striving ceases. 
I love it when a church knows it's time to sit down. <laughs> that works for me. Every once in a while, I get a little stressed out. Now, I know you guys might find that impossible to believe, but um, with the new year, we got a little bulletin at work, and what I found out is that there's less than 70 people in the country who do what I do for a living. And that also made me realize that when people ask me what I do for a living, the reason their eyes glaze over and they kind of look like they're going to maybe pass out or something is because it's probably really not that interesting. I should just be nice and say, I work on computers. And go with that. Stress is kind of one of those things that's, uh, it can make you do amazing things and it can help you achieve things. But stress by itself, and just so you know, I, I do have something to do with cardiology and I've learned over the years, without the job that I do, that stress kills people. Stress can lead to heart attacks. Stress can lead to your body not being able to fight off diseases. Stress can be very, very bad for you. There's 25 verses in the Bible which talk about anxiety and stress. And I've learned in my life it's kind of like you can pick one and you can go with it and you can make it as complicated as you want to, which leads to more stress. And you can use all kinds of eloquent words, but I'll tell you a little story. Maybe this will help. Um, December 30th. What's that? New Year's Eve's Eve, right? Yeah. Okay. I got a job to do on New Year's Eve. First thing in the morning, like early in the morning. And I'm thinking about it. I'd already talked to God about it. I really did. I, I talk to God when I have things like that I need to do because I've learned that I'm one person, and even though it may be a one-person job, it goes a lot better when God's hand's in it. Okay? So I think about this thing I need to do, and do I have all my stuff? 
I'm going to need a garden hose. Do I have the right garden hose? Do I have the right nozzle? Mm, oh, got to have a rake. Got to have a shovel. Got everything in the truck, ready to go. Check the alarm three times. Yep, still set for 6.45. Should be good. I know how to do this. I've done this hundreds of times. This is a piece of cake. But it's dangerous. It's risky. Talk to God about it. Check, check, check. Every day of the past week, talk to God about it. The weather needs to be just right. Perfect. Too much humidity, it won't work right. Too little humidity, it's dangerous, okay? So I wake up Saturday morning at 4.15 a.m. Can't go back to sleep. Literally went outside, checked on the truck, made sure it was still there and everything was still in the back, okay? Uh, made sure that I still had stuff to eat for breakfast. That hadn't moved either. And then about... 5.45, I started to realize how foolish I was. Really. I looked at the weather forecast when I first woke up and realized, oh, we're going to have some light showers. Perfect. Couldn't ask for better. God provided everything I needed, all the tools, the wit about myself, the job I needed to do. And here I am being foolish and nervous and anxious rather than getting my sleep that I needed to do the job so I'd have my wits about me. Well, I realized about that time I just might as well go ahead and eat and get going. So I did, and everything worked out fine, long story short. But it made me realize something. It doesn't matter how smart you think you are. It doesn't matter what you have to tackle. You start leaving God out of it, things get a little messy, and things get a little confusing, and things get to the point where you feel like you just can't deal with it. So there's a real nice passage. Can you bring up our first passage, please? I used to have this memorized. Um, it's uh, something that Paul wrote. Great, great passage. Therefore, my brothers, and, uh, and oh, I'm sorry, uh, wrong one here. Here we go. Uh, first Philippians uh, 4. You guys can all read that real well there, right? Yeah, can you, yeah, everybody can read that, right? Yeah. So rejoice in the Lord always, I say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Beautiful passage. Now I know those of you that said you can read that, I really appreciate you, you know, if you can read that. I, I want your eye doctor, okay? But the thing is, is, it's a lot of words. There's a lot of eloquence there. And I will tell you, if you still have the gift of memorization, memorize that. That's something that can be very helpful. But I must tell you, at about 6 o'clock in the morning, this wasn't the passage I was thinking of. Can you go to the next slide, please? This is the passage I thought about. Why? because it's less words, okay? I can remember this one. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In other words, <clears throat> Tom, stop losing it. Just remember you gave this to God, okay? Communion time is one of those times when we get close to God, when we commune with him. We must remember we are that sanctuary, okay? Holy Spirit dwells in us. And there's little more we can do to ask God to get closer to us than dwelling in us with that gift of the Holy Spirit. Christ gave so many things on us, or so many things for us, because he cares for us. And it makes it easy. It makes it easy to be a Christian. It makes it easy to commune with God. It makes it easy to do the things that we want to do in our heart that sometimes we forget. God pushed the easy button for us and gave us Christ. So as we go to commune with the Lord, um, please don't feel anxious about things in your life that you need to work on, okay? Um, bring those to Christ. Ask for help. And when he gives you help, sometimes that means you may have to do a little bit of work, and that's okay. Because in our world, 
and in our life, we understand that everything isn't cut and dry and everything isn't clean. But Christ cleans us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the time we have where we can commune with you, Lord. We thank you so much for this bread representing Christ's body broken for us, Lord, and the cup, his blood shed for us, Lord. We have so much freedom from sin through this, and I pray that um, pray we lean on that and that we would trust in that. And when we feel like we can't accomplish what we need to accomplish or we can't make changes in our life, which is also something we need to accomplish, we wouldn't be afraid to. Thank you so much for your love and your guidance through this. In your son's name we pray, amen. Do you believe in Jesus or do you believe about Jesus? There is a huge difference between, between believing things about Jesus, like believing the facts, the figures, and believing in Jesus, the person. And on one level, we can intellectually agree with the truth claims about Jesus or agree with the statements that Jesus made and on another level, we believe in Jesus himself, in the person, in the being, in the deity, in who he was. And you can see how that plays out in people's lives. If they merely believe truths about Jesus, they tend to uh, walk in a particular way of life. Or if they believe truly in Jesus, you can see the fruit of them following Jesus in their lives. I have a, friend, a preacher friend who is a missionary in Africa, has been there for many years, 
And he says that back in the day when a particular group of missionaries had first gotten to Africa, that it was evident between those who really accepted Jesus and believed in Jesus and those who just merely believed the things about Jesus. And he said that those who believed about Jesus, they tended to be really legalistic in their understanding of, of the teachings of Jesus, very legalistic in how they lived it out. But those who believed in Jesus and who followed Jesus, their whole demeanor, their, their countenance, their grace, their hope, their faith was of a higher, much higher quality, and it was noticeable by those around them. And so we can believe about Jesus or we can believe in Jesus. But many of us struggle with that transition. We struggle with internalizing and believing in Jesus. Uh, it might be because maybe we've grown up in the church, we've grown up being familiar about Jesus, knowing about Jesus. Maybe we, we believe about Jesus because we've always gone to church, or our parents did, or our grandparents did. Um, and so we know everything about Jesus, but there hasn't been that, that belief that penetrates our heart and soul. Um, maybe we struggle because we live in 21st century America, uh, many, of you, many of us were born in 20th century, century America, that's weird to say. And so we come packaged with all the assumptions and all the perceptions of living in our culture and our time and our place. And that is vastly different from the time and place of Jesus. And so there is this disconnect, this cultural weirdness that we have when we're reading scripture. It doesn't quite make sense or you know, we can't quite connect it to uh, today's day and age. And so there's a little bit of awkwardness there. Or maybe as we have grown up, uh, a lot of these assumptions that we have picked up through our education and schooling, uh, the things that we think or believe is kind of contrary to what the scripture teaches. And so the, the assumptions that we've grown up with, the knowledge that we have acquired, you know, kind of seems to not jive with the Bible. And so there is, and that's an old term. Some of y'all might need to look that up in the, in the internet. What does jive mean? It doesn't quite correspond with, with Scripture, and so there's that, that disconnect, and so it might be hard to believe uh, because of just how we have been brought up. And so we can ask ourselves a very important question. How do people believe in Jesus? How do they truly believe? How do they make this transition? Now, this is a very exhaustive uh, endeavor that we could go on, but today we're going to be looking at John chapter 2, and we begin to answer the question as we go through this text. Uh, so far in chapter 1, as Jonathan opened our series up last week, Jonathan talking about the Gospel of John, um, we can get really confused by names. And also there's this guy named John the Baptist. So we have all of these Johns and Jonathans, and so hopefully we don't get confused. In John chapter 1, we are introduced to Jesus. And John describes to us through his own words and through uh, different characters in the story, reveals to us who Jesus is. We learn that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he's the light of the world, that he is the unifying concept of the universe that he is divine wisdom in the flesh, that he is the creator of all things, and that he is the long-expected Messiah. Now that is a lot for John to claim, right? For the people who would have been reading his gospel in that day, they would have said, that is a lot to claim. Like, this, this is impossible. There is no way that could be true. And so John, throughout the rest of the gospel, shows us through the life and teachings of Jesus, that those claims are in fact true. But yeah, it is a lot for people, a lot to claim, a lot for people to believe. And so in John chapter 1, we are introduced to Jesus as he begins his ministry, and he begins to assemble a group of apprentices to learn his teaching and way of life. We call these disciples. Disciples in that day, they would have uh, studied under a teacher and they would have spent significant time from that teacher learning their philosophy and how that philosophy and teaching worked its way out in everyday life. And so this was a very intense uh, program of study and apprenticeship and learning of Jesus. And so far in the text, we've only been introduced to about five of them so far, John is 
uh, he's not as clear because he, he doesn't, he tries to not name himself. He tries to be anonymous. And so counting uh, different people can be cumbersome because he kind of excludes himself. He's kind of in the shadows a little bit. Even though he's one of Jesus' three closest disciples, he kind of keeps himself a little anonymous in his own letter. Uh, maybe a little humility is at play there. Anyhow, so there's about five people that Jesus so far has assembled to his team of apprentices, and they are themselves on a journey of belief in Jesus. Jesus so far has only started his public ministry. He's spent a day uh, around where John the Baptist is. He spends a day hanging out after that, and then he heads to a Galilee where he's been there for a day or three, depending on how the counting is done. And so these guys have only been with him for a couple of days, for less than seven days. And so they have heard some of these claims about Jesus. Some of them have said things about Jesus, but they are themselves on this journey of discovery. And so as we take a look at their quest, maybe we can help find some answers about our own. And so this is what happens in John chapter 2. So on the third day, that might have been the third day that Jesus is in Galilee, or the third day that of John's counting of days in the gospel, it's not clear, but really early on in Jesus' ministry. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, what business do you have with me, woman? My hour has not yet come. So his mother said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. So Jesus and his disciples, they end up getting invited to this wedding, uh, perhaps because Jesus' mother had already been there participating in the festivities. Now, whenever there was a wedding in that day, they didn't just have a reception that lasted for a few hours after the wedding. Their, their time of celebration lasted for about a week. And so during that time, there would be lots of food, there'd be lots of wine, dancing, you know, celebrating uh, this new union that had taken place. And usually what is interesting about this, too, is that at this point in history, people got married really, really young. Girls 12 or 13 and boys somewhere around that age. Sometimes the men would be older, but usually like my kids would be married or about married at this time. Like that is just a crazy thing to think about. And so everybody, their family, their friends, they're all gathered celebrating this wedding feast. And Je Jesus and his disciples, there's not all 12 of them there yet. And so they're not imposing that much, but they're still invited and they are participating in that event. And during that time, the groom and his family were responsible for making sure that there was enough food and wine. And people are coming and going, and you see Jesus and his disciples uh, had, were invited, and so they had to plan for more than what they expected because you never know who's going to show up. You could have, like, third cousins five times removed showing up for the, for the party, you know? And, and so that you have to be really well prepared. And for food or wine to run out, this would have been a very big deal. It would have been socially embarrassing. It would have made the groom and his family look like they're inept, they can't plan, they don't know anything about logistics, or maybe they're poor, and so they can't afford uh, enough wine and food for the celebration to continue. And so it was a really big deal. Like They would have been treated kind of like outcasts for not being able to provide for all of these people. And there was also some legal ramifications for the groom and his family if the wine and food had run out. Like people could like sue or whatever. There could be penalties for them running out of stuff. Right? So it's not just like, oh, we didn't plan enough. The caterer didn't bring enough. It was like there could be some serious ramifications for all of this. And so for the wine to run out, like that is a very tense, very strange situation to happen. The, the stress, the anxiety that Tom talked about. Like, people are going to start stressing out and freaking out here in a moment because, oh my goodness, there isn't enough for everybody. And so Mary is there. She knows, obviously, who Jesus is. She knows of his significance and his abilities. And so she calls on him to do something about this problem. And his response seems a little bit terse. It seems a little bit uh, disrespectful, even, but Jesus, as he is talking to Mary, he's actually being really formal. 
in how he is talking to her, which would have been appropriate for a, a, a man showing honor to his, uh, to his mother at a, at a public event. He is being formal, res- actually being respectful of her. Woman isn't like, woman, give me my drink. It's like, you know, elevating her status. Woman, you know, she's really important. Uh, but he says something rather curious uh, where he says, my hour has not yet come. Now, the way I kind of remember this being explained when I was younger is that, Jesus, that Mary is kind of imposing on Jesus. He's not quite ready to start his public ministry, and she has to give him a little bit of a push, you know, kick him out of the nest to get him started on his public ministry. And so he's really reluctant to do anything about it because he's not ready yet to start his public ministry. But there's a problem with that. What had Jesus already been doing? What had he already done? He already began his public ministry in, in, down in Judah when he goes to see John the Baptist and is baptized and all that kind of stuff. He's already started his public ministry. He's already started calling his disciples. He has gone to Galilee so that he can start doing some really awesome things. So his time for public ministry had come. It's not like he's being reluctant. Um, what, John is, what Jesus is actually doing is he is foreshadowing something else. When he says, my hour, that is a very specific phrase that is going to come up later in the gospel. So Jesus is um, he's foreshadowing something that is related to food and drink. I'm not going to spoil the surprise. I'll let y'all read it and discover that for yourselves later. He's not being reluctant to start his public ministry. That is why he has started. He's already started. He's alluding to something else entirely. But Um, He is called upon to help this humiliating situation. And I think some of us, um, we we can put ourselves in this groom's shoes. Not that we've ever been in that situation of getting married young and running out of uh, party supplies, but all of us certainly have been in situations where we have been embarrassed. How many of you have ever been embarrassed or humiliated yourself? Right? I have the, the joy of public speaking, and I don't know if you know anything about public speaking, but sometimes you say things that are either grammatically incorrect or factually incorrect, or maybe you just get caught up in the moment and you say something really stupid, right? And so that happens, and you have an audience of people to remind you about it, right? So all of us have been humiliated at one point or another. Maybe you, you made a mistake, and someone made you feel like a piece of garbage because of maybe a simple mistake that you had uh, done. Or maybe you were in front of a group of people and someone insulted you in your honor and you just wanted to fight them because how dare they insult you in front of uh, others. Or, or maybe you, uh, your private sins were made public by gossip or the newspaper or by some public comment on social media. And so now everybody knows. Back in the day, they used to do that in the hairdresser's place, which I'm sure they still do. Now it's all over the internet. Like billions of people can read about it. So you can be really embarrassed. Um, Or maybe you had family over Thanksgiving or Christmas and you ran out of food or maybe the turkey was like burned or you like cut into it and it's just air. Um, (laughs) Christmas vacation. And you know, so like you just are so embarrassed. You're humiliated that you ruined Christmas. But humiliating experiences provide an opportunity to turn to Jesus as Mary does here. We can seek his wisdom. We can ask him to resolve our problem. We can experience his comfort and boldness in the midst of these humiliating circumstances so that we can keep going forward. And so John introduces us to this this potentially disastrous situation. Is Jesus actually going to do something? That's the question. He doesn't seem like he wants to. I use that in air quotes. Um, and I'll say this, oftentimes if Jesus seems reluctant, like he, that is often a test of, of faith, uh, trying to challenge people um, and where they're at. Anyhow, so, now there were six stone water pots standing there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing two or three measures each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. So Jesus improvises in this situation and he decides to use these water pots that are dedicated to purification rituals to do something about the situation. Now these uh, these pots, in in total, all of them together, 
hold about 120 to 100, 180 gallons of water, 20 to 30 gallons a piece. Um, but they were there, set aside, not doing anything, because they were there for a very specific purpose, and that is different Jewish purification rituals. And so you, those are like, uh, how many of you have really special china that you only pull out during Thanksgiving or Christmas? Right? When I grew up, there was some, when we go to family, like they, they brought out the nice china. And I understand that, right? Because I have kids and I'm clumsy myself. Sometimes you don't want the really nice expensive things to break. So you just pull them out for special occasions. That is kind of what this is like, but more significant, right? They, they only use these things for rituals, uh, for purification rituals, because it, you don't want them to be unclean. And so if you're trying to purify yourself, if they're ritually unclean, then they're pointless. So they're set aside for a very specific use. But Jesus calls them into service. He repurposes them for something else. Now, for, to use these pots for non-ceremonial purposes went against their social norms. They could have, I mean, there's nothing in Scripture that forbids them from using these pots for anything else. They could do what they want with them, but it is against social customs. And some people would have been offended that they dare use these special pots for this ordinary purpose, especially people like the Pharisees, which we're going to learn about later. So some people certainly would have been offended by Jesus' actions. But he starts to give directions to the servants, and they, this flabbergasts me. They listen, they listen to Jesus. Why should they listen to him? What fame or authority does he have at this point? Does anybody know who Jesus is so far? Some people around where John the Baptist was, they, they understood when, G, when John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, but Jesus is relocated right now. He's in Cana. Um, it is a very small town. Nobody knows really who he is. Just some stranger from out of town. He has no role in the feast. He's no responsibility. He's just a guest. But if you're them, what do you have to lose? Right? What do you have to lose? At, at best... Uh, you're, you're, you can be busying yourself by going and fetching the water. That's going to take some time. You could busy yourself while, while the, 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 the drama happens here. You can be out fetching water. Because no doubt, when people start discovering that there is no wine, people start getting upset, you're going to want to be away from that. Because if, if you've ever been to a place where, um, where a customer is disgruntled by their food or you know, their food order got messed up or whatever, they usually take it out on who first? The waiter. And then if they're not satisfied with the waiter, who do they call? The manager, especially if your name is Karen. I don't know if y'all I don't know if y'all y'all know about that. That's like an internet joke. Sorry, Karen. I don't want to offend you. Um, but usually you talk to the Karen talks to the manager. But you first take it out on the waitress or the waiter, right? And they get the brunt of all this effort. And so if they could get out of the room while every, all this drama is happening, like, that is so, that, fine, we'll do what he says. We'll be out of the room. We can get away from all of this drama. And so they can at least keep busy while this embarrassing situation unfolds. And maybe they can watch a slow-motion train wreck from afar. And they're probably asking, what's a train? Um, and so when the yelling starts, they're gone. But for us, it's important to recognize that Jesus disregards social customs in order to work out his plan. We'll see this all throughout his gospel. We, as people, we, we tend to get into ruts. We, we tend to, to form habits and traditions and customs. And, and sometimes those things get in the way of what Jesus wants to do. Because, they, oh, these special pots, we can't touch them because they're only for Christmas. But maybe Jesus wants us to use them for something else, right? Um, and this can happen to all of us, right? All of us can get into a rut. Most days when I go to work, I, I bring my lunch and I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I have chips or pretzels. I have uh, some kind of a dessert because you have to have dessert with your meal. Um, I bring an energy bar for snack and usually a banana or an apple also for snack. And I bring an emergency uh, granola bar in case all of that isn't enough and I get famished during the day and I need something else to eat and I have a little bit bonus food in my lunchbox. So any day you know, when, I'm, when I'm going to work, that is what I have in my lunchbox. It usually doesn't deviate from that. So yes, it is really easy to get in a rut. Right? Because, man, if there's this really good leftover, I want to bring it to lunch. No, I can't because I have to have peanut butter. No. I'm going to throw out that peanut butter and jelly. We're going to have some good macaroni and cheese today. Right? 
So it is important that we don't get tied to certain ways of doing things or certain objects or certain tools uh, because sometimes these can, we can get focused on those rather than doing what Jesus wants us to do. We can miss Jesus' plans and purpose for our lives or for our congregation by focusing on uh, something that really isn't, in Jesus' eyes, important. What is essential is Jesus' truth. What is essential is, is the good news of Jesus. And what is essential is our mission to make disciples of all nations. And the rest of it is just trying to find the right tool to do the right job in the right context in order to make that a reality. And sometimes that means that we have to use a screwdriver as a pry bar. Some, some people are like twitching about that. Like sometimes you've got to use the tool for something it's not intended for in order to get the job done. And so the servants, they go out and fetch the water, which, you know, again, that's like a confusing thing. We need wine. Why are you going to get water? Well, people need something to drink while they've had enough to drink. Okay, so this is what happens. Now, the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the groom, and he said to him, Every man serves a good wine first, and when the guests, ha are, when the guests are drunk, then he serves the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Now, I want to say, hold on a minute. What did Jesus turn the water into? Welch's grape juice? Wine, yes, uh, and, and so that is, un, for some people, that is an uncomfortable topic, and I, and I, and I, and I get that. Uh, Jesus turned the water into wine, and it's un, unambiguous. When you look at the Greek language and all that kind of stuff, some people try to, to get around it, but unambiguously, this is really, really good wine. Uh, really good, the best, top shelf, probably undiluted wine. Now, I'm not going to get on a, uh, a, on a soapbox of... Um, the topic of Christians and alcohol, because the Bible speaks about this in, in a wide variety of ways. It's a very nuanced conversation about moderation and avoiding drunkenness. Wisdom dictates that if you can't handle it, stay away from it. And if you struggle with it, there's always help. Now, uh, normally in a fe feast like this, the people would start serving the good quality wine first, and then they would switch to lower quality diluted wine later. And that is, uh, that is partly because when you're, you're drunk, you can't taste it as well. When you've had enough, you can't taste enough. And also over time, if you're drinking the same thing, it doesn't taste good the longer you, you participate. And so when you, are, when you first sit down, you, you, if like you sit down and eat like a whole thing of ice cream, that's probably more realistic. Like you get a, a pint of, big pint of ice cream from the store, like Ben and Jerry's is the good kind, and you're eating it. The first few bites are going to taste really good, but then once you get towards the bottom of the container, not only are you regretting your choice, but it doesn't taste as good because of how your taste buds work, right? And so it's just a matter of practicality. Like it, it literally, your, your tongue can't taste the difference between good wine and bad wine, and so why, why waste all this money? And so they, they start giving out the diluted wine that, so that it, it can go further and people don't notice. And that, that, that diluted wine was still alcoholic. It was still about 3% alcohol by volume, which is a little less in a light beer, uh, to put it into context. It's still intoxicating depending on a person's weight, their consumption rate, and their metabolism. Um, and so, but they are even out of that. And so the wine that Jesus makes is the best. It is not the lowest quality. And that tells us, that shows us something about Jesus and his character and, and how he is just an abundant, gracious, loving God. But not only that, but he saves the groom from embarrassment. Like he steps in and helps this guy. I mean, he, he's starting off his family. He's starting off his new life. And Jesus helps to save him from embarrassment in this situation, which is a, not, a, a nice act of grace. And also, he makes the guy look like he's rich and he's generous. Right? It makes the groom look good in all of this. But what, what, I, what I see in this is there is a very awesome act of creation happening. Because Jesus had drawn, they had the, the guys just draw out water. And the chemical composition of water is significantly different than the chemical composition of wine. Wine has uh, alcohol, it has different sugars, it has uh, different, it has proteins, it has glycerin, it has hundreds of other compounds that, that give it its complex taste. 
Right? So there's hundreds of different compounds rather than just straight H2O. And so there is something fundamentally that transforms in the pot to make it go from H2O to this really complex chemical formulation that is called wine. And that is not something that you can accomplish by just party tricks. That's not something that you can do just adding a packet of Kool-Aid mix to water. Like this is a really significant miracle that Jesus does. It is a very complex act of transformation of creation. And when you look at this situation that Jesus, does he touch the pot, pots of water? No. Does, does Jesus draw out the water to bring it to the head waiter? Right? Jesus is doing all of this from afar. He just says to do it, and it happens. Just like at creation, when God spoke and everything was formed as it is, it happened through the decree of God. And, and that is what is happening here. Jesus just says it, and it happens. And so we recognize that in this, Jesus is not just some philosopher or teacher. He's not just some prophet who comes wandering up on the scene. He is the creator of everything. Right? He can just command water, H2O, become wine, and it becomes wine. And not just bottom shelf stuff, it becomes the best. So Jesus is the creator of everything. Right? There are times in our lives we feel powerless. It seems like our, our situation is impossible. We lack the ability to make a change for the better. But we also know Jesus, the creator of everything. Now in this story, we're supposed to have been keeping track of the disciples. We're supposed to be learning from them in this situation. So far, we've only been talking about the servants and the groom and Jesus. Where have they been in all of this? Well, John tells us, this beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The disciples were there. They're sitting, uh, uh, participating in the banquet just as Jesus had, but they're doing more than just feasting. They're watching and learning from Jesus. They knew the truth of who Jesus is because that is why they begin to follow him. They, they know that Jesus is the Lamb of God. They know that he's the light of the world. They know that he is the Messiah, but yet they don't fully believe, they don't fully know, they don't fully trust. And so they are on this, this, this journey of discovery of who Jesus is and what he is fully capable of doing. It is at this wedding feast in a very small, we didn't, I didn't mention it, but Cana is a very small place. It is just as insignificant as Galilee, or as Nazareth. Like this is a very, very small town. I don't even think that archaeologists have found the remains of Cana yet. It is just, it's lost, it's gone, it's, it's small in significance. Which, by the way, when, when a, a man from Cana says, can anything good come from Nazareth? He's not belittling Jesus and his lineage. He himself knows nothing good comes from Cana. I'm from Cana, There's, this is just a hole in the wall place. But Jesus chooses this small wedding in this insignificant little town to reveal his power to show, to begin to show his disciples who he is and what he is capable of. It's not an overt, in-your-face, look-at-me scene that Jesus does this. It is a very subtle miracle. And Jesus allows the honor to go to somebody else and not himself, which is amazing. But as the disciples, they see this miracle of water turning into wine, it causes them to believe and Jesus, they already believed about Jesus. They knew the truth of who he was, but it is when they see his power at work, when they see his glory, they have faith. They believe in him. They saw the water. They saw it turn into wine. They probably tasted the wine after it was made. They exper personally experienced the miracle. And so that we can learn from their direct experience, they write it down. For us to learn from. But Jesus' power isn't just limited to that wedding feast in Cana. We see Jesus' power at work all around us. 
Because we've already asserted the fact that Jesus is the creator of everything. When we look at the universe, we see his power on display everywhere. When you look in, in the space and you look at the, the breadth of all of creation and how big the universe is, and when we use all of these telescopes and satellites to peer as far as we can, uh, we see his glory at work in all the nebula and all the stars and all the constellations that are out there. And we also see his glory when we look at the subatomic level. Like his glory, his power is evident all over creation. And so we see it everywhere. But also, sometimes in our lives, we find ourselves in difficult or embarrassing situations. And, and Jesus gets us out of those situations. He rescues us. Sometimes, though, as we're in those situations, he might not rescue us but he gives us the strength and the capability to get through those things. And so we see his power at work there. Now, we also witness new life being brought into the world, and that is a miracle. We see God creating new life every day in our world. And we also see people's lives transformed as, as they believe in Jesus, they follow Jesus, that, that the, the sins and the habits and the things that ensnare them, we see that they're freed from those things and they become a completely different person. So when you look at them five years ago and they were just a wicked, evil, terrible person and you see them now and their life is just completely transformed, that's the power of Jesus at work. So how do people truly believe in Jesus? Well, Jesus' power brings faith. Jesus' power causes us to believe in him. It's not the only thing, but it is one of the more significant things that help us to truly connect our heart and our head and our mind and our soul all together to fully believe who Jesus is. Sometimes that connection happens as we hear about the testimony of others, that others are speaking of, of the power of God in their lives, the, the, the power of transformation as they've gone from their old self to the new self. Sometimes we, we read the, the Gospels and we see John's eyewitness testimony. We see through his eyes the power of Jesus displayed 2,000 years ago. We see Jesus' power on display as we consider the empty tomb. And so see where Jesus' power is at work in our world. It is at work. It is working even now. Look at Scripture. Look at the eyewitnesses account, eyewitness accounts of people in the Gospels. They were there. They saw. They, they, they experienced all of these things firsthand. And as you consider the power of Jesus at work then and now, let that move you to believe in Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you help us to believe in you. That because, sometimes because of our assumptions, our upbringing, it is really hard for us to believe, to have faith, to trust you. But you help us through eyewitness testimony, by displaying your power in the world, by the, the scriptures that we have that record all of the things that you did uh, while you're walking this earth. And so, Father, sometimes we still struggle, and I pray that you would help us to believe in you with our heart, with our mind, with our soul, with our entire being, and help us to bridge the gap between doubt and faith, between questioning and finding the answers. Uh, help us to, to just have a solid belief and trust in you. And Father, I pray for anybody who is far from you, who needs to accept uh, your salvation so that they can begin this, trans this life of transformation as you rescue them from their sins and, and their hang-ups and their habits. I pray that they would turn to you today, that they would find freedom from those things, that they would find your love and forgiveness. And Father, I pray for all of us as we struggle with belief at different times. I pray that you would help us to see your power at work and be reminded of who you are so that we might believe in you afresh. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, Joe. Uh, it's an opportunity for us again to take a look at our personal relationship with Christ. I can't help but to think that each person who saw that miracle had to come to grips with who is this person? What, where did this come from? You know, and, and it's still the same in our lives today. It's not about those sitting to our left or to our right or our neighbor down the street or family that we grew up with. Ultimately, it's about our personal relationship, and the question is, where do we stand with God, and where do we stand with Jesus Christ? And so that's a question that we ask uh, each of you today 
as you think about your faith in Christ and as we sing together and give you an opportunity to make any decisions uh, that will be helpful in your walk with Christ. If you want to make a personal decision, uh, that's in encourage you to do so, perhaps to, to join the church here. If you've uh, taken those steps according to Scripture, uh, we invite you to come. Let's be standing as we sing, uh, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he saved his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning I repented of my sins and won the victory. Sing out now. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He punched me of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. All right. Folks, uh, we are blessed with a lot of hard workers around here at the church, and we want to say a big thank you for all of you who brought uh, food to help out with the uh, families in need. We were able to help out four families uh, this past Christmas, so thank you for all of you that participated in that. Also, thank you for the two of you that came out uh, yesterday morning, helped clean up the church. If you noticed, it's not Christmassy in here anymore. Uh, we're into the new year. And then, of course, thanks for everybody pitching in. Uh, today for our potluck dinner. Uh, we've got plenty of food back there, lots of food, and we want to encourage you to come and just stay, enjoy a good meal together. And then if, uh, if you're able, please uh, plan to stay for the movie uh, afterwards uh, called Life Mark. So let's uh, pray together uh, for the food and we'll enjoy our time together. Father God, we just uh, come to you and we thank you again for being our God. Father, I just pray that uh, Sunday may be an encouraging time for us. Father, as we look to you, as we just are inspired in our hearts, as we are reminded of our faith and we are reminded of our victory in Jesus, and Lord, that's a personal relationship. That's something that only we can decide and only we can be inspired by. Lord, help us to, to move forward uh, with what you have given us. And Lord, thank you for this food uh, that you have provided and for everyone who's pitched in and uh, time together, and Lord, help us throughout the week. 
as we move forward. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.